Good morning, Gay. It's really great to have the opportunity to speak to you again, talking with Gay Spann of the Association of Black Travel Professionals. Gay, I, I wanted to start actually by telling you a story, if you'll, if you'll allow me the space to do this. I, ha I have a, a friend who lives in South Africa and he's got fed up with tourists coming to him and complaining that the, the Bushmen in the Kalahari um, no longer just wear the um, the loincloth, or, or as some tour operators insist on calling it the g-string, which I find really offensive. But he he says what well, you know. He says, well, he says, um, you know, I get really disappointed when I go to London because I've heard about the beef eaters, and and I'm expecting to find the beef eaters in London. I expect to find one on the tube and 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 going home after work and and then I get to the Tower of London and I see that they're there in their splendid costumes but I don't see them anywhere else and then I realize that they've gone to work and got specially dressed up in their costumes and I guess the problem is I'm, a, I'm two or three hundred years too late I'm just arriving too late and that's the problem with the beef eaters in London and the the Bushmen in the Kalahari isn't it does that resonate with you Gay? Yeah I mean I think what your friend is coming to awareness, you know, from his experience with tourists is they want to have um, an authentic experience, but they're not taking the experience, uh, they're not understanding the context of the experience, right, where it, it turns out to be maybe statements that are devaluing of the actual culture that they're visiting. I guess what they really want is to buy a time travel ticket, isn't it? They don't want an air travel ticket. They want a time travel ticket. And unfortunately, we can't offer them that yet. I mean, the first business that offers that will make a lot of money, won't they, Gay? Absolutely, absolutely. But, you know, um, it's really interesting because um, there's a trend right now in travel called experiential travel, yeah. where consumers want to have a local experience. They don't want just an airline ticket in a, in a hotel room and they don't want to just go to tourist sites. They want to have a legitimate, authentic interaction with the community that they're visiting. And um, I think that trend is, I think it's a good trend. And I think a lot of um, companies are taking on that, you know, that, that mission and doing actually some really good things in the industry. They are, but I, I wonder whether they're giving a, um, I wonder if they're giving the full spectrum of those experiences. Right. Now, I think that's a good point. Um, I think, you know, when you, when you um, go to a place, I'm just going to use London because you used it and it's top of head for me, top of mind for me. Um, you know, the story about going to London is palaces and kings and queens, right? But the, the story of the Windrush generation is not part of the mainstream story of London, but it is totally a part of the, main, of the, of the actual history of yeah. what, what, what made London what it is today. And I think what you're saying is that some of these uh, experiences get pushed to the side as other experiences and not incorporated into the main uh, sites or the main um, information that's given to tourists about the country. I think that's what you're you're saying. Yes, and of course it, in a country like Britain, which has got such a long history, there are places you can go to. I mean Brick Lane would be one example in the East End of London, which is now predominantly um Bengali, Bangladeshi um environment but it's had successive waves of migrants who've come through. So the same buildings would have been used for different kinds of religious worship. They've been converted back and forth between different religious purposes yeah. and that's a fascinating piece of the history of London and obviously some tourists do access that but it's a tiny fragment of, of, of the total number most miss that completely yeah I think I think where this where that comes from is you know it, it's a, it's the best term to use but the whitewashing of history right yes. Um, as they say, history is told by the victor, and um, and a lot of people's stories get left out. And you know, at least in my country, that's one of the things that um, is a big discussion right now um, about what is the actual history of this country, where a lot of Americans do not understand, you know, actual things that happen that you know affect how this country uh, 
developed, how the system's in place, you know, why certain things are the way they are. Um, and it comes into play um, in tourism. It still, it does fit into tourism. Um, you know, I went to, I'm from the Northeast, which is, you know, New England. And I never lived in the South and now I live in Atlanta. So um, I'm not very familiar with the Southeast, some of the Southern states, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, even Florida, South Carolina, you know, those are states that I know, but I've not spent a lot of time in those no. states. So I did get the opportunity to go to Charleston um, not too long ago. And, um, and I chose specifically to do two different tours. The first tour I took was a mainstream Charleston tour where the tour, off, the tour leader was a white person and um, it was mixed, white people, black people, outsiders on this walking tour of downtown Charleston. And the history was given in such a way that downplayed the, uh, the, the place that slavery played in developing Charleston to the riches that it ultimately gained from the, from the um, slave tour, um, the slave trade. So later that same day, I took an, a second tour, which was featuring specifically Black history in Charleston. And then that tour gave more information. It, we went to almost the same places I see, yeah. and ho heard slightly different stories, <laughs> you know? And like one, one, one big inconsistency that really kind of got to me was there's a market in Charleston, if you ever get to go. First of all, it's a beautiful city, so I encourage people to visit. But they have a market. And when I went on the generic tour or the mainstream tour, the guy made a lot of pains to say that slaves were not traded in this market. Hmm. A lot of pains were made because now when you go, they view, they reuse that structure and you've got vendors selling soap. You've got vendors selling hats and t-shirts. The last thing they want tourists to think about <laughs> were the humans in bondage that were being sold there hundreds of years ago. So they do it. They take a lot of pains to say that it wasn't happening there. Then when you go on the other tour, you, you realize that the building where the market is, is right in front of the, um, the, um, what do you call it? The commodity house. So, you know, when yeah. you had trade, the boats would come in, you had to declare your goods. Yes. And they come out to market. So the market is in front of the commodity house. So come on, really? <laughs> so it's, it, you know, it's a little bit frustrating, I think. Just incorporate the truth. Just tell the whole story. You know, that way people get a, a really good, true, true, true experience about what a place really has. You know, what's the history of the place really was. The, the other dishonesty that creeps in is, is about the time frame, isn't it? I mean, you just said hundreds of years ago, but actually slavery was in America only 100 years ago. It, well, we were enslaved for 400 years, and you're right, exactly. Yeah. Uh, there's another example from South Africa which really hit me. There's a District 6 museum in Cape Town, um, which you may have heard of. Yes. You have. I've been to South Africa. I've been to Cape Town. Yeah, but you see, I know lots of UK operators who would have featured that exhibition that because I think in New York that would be a top 10 attraction actually it's a very high quality tourist experience uh, I'm sure in New York it would make the top 10 but um, it was interesting these were all operators who did subsequently feature it in their programs but they'd not been told about it by their incoming agent wow. in Cape but what really drove it home to me because I'd, I'd learned about apartheid at school and so on and I kind of thought it was historic. And then I realized the District 6 clearances took place while I was in school learning history. And somehow that time elapsed difference, that understanding of how recent or how long ago it was, is an important part of, of understanding its significance in the modern world. And too often the time frame shifts, doesn't it? To the advantage yeah. of the winner in that particular battle. Yeah. Um, I, I think you're right. We need a, a lot more honesty in the way in which these tours are presented if 
travel is to broaden the mind rather than simply reinforce prejudices. Exactly. That's you, I couldn't have said it any better myself. You know, um, I've been to South Africa, and for me, I was in college when we were protesting divestiture. You know, I I remember as a young person when um, you know Jesse Jackson and a lot of American. Yeah. Um, activists were calling for divestiture. I remember when Nelson Mandela was freed. I mean, you know, and, and it's very, it's interesting, you know, when I go, when I went there, I remember the first time, you know, as a black, as a black person walking around South Africa, looking at white South Africans, like you were alive for apartheid. Like, you know, I'm not sure how you feel about me as a black person. Um, you know, that adds to the experience for me when I'm in South Africa. Um, but, you know, one thing that happens a lot is they, what I've heard sometimes is that uh, white South Africans that were in apartheid think that black people from other countries are different than the black people in South Africa. Like, oh, you're something different, which, you know, is problematic. Let's say that. <laughs> it is. It certainly yeah. is. Yeah. So I think, you know, I think tourism, <clears throat> um, there's a, a, as I spoke about this experiential travel, tourism has an opportunity to expand the stories, to incorporate the true experiences of a country. And you know what, um, I hate that um, diversity means woe is me and sad stories, you know, because there's also stories of triumph from um, people that are indigenous or that are, you know, people of color that have made impacts, serious impacts um, into uh, mainstream culture. And I just think it, it hurts the, it hurts the whole, um, the, the whole, if you leave out these parts, because yeah. that's what, one of the things that we're trying to say nowadays, we want people to unite. We're trying to say diversity is important you know, different voices and different viewpoints make it all better. So one of the ways we can, you know, attack this is by increasing diversity in travel, you know, increasing diversity in the offerings. Um, you know, another thing that I think, you know, encouraging our clients, if you're in the Caribbean, to get off the resort, yeah. go, into the, <laughs> go into town, meet local, you know, don't feel intimidated because you're different. You know, I think people need to understand, like I've traveled, I've been in Africa, I've been in Asia, I've been in Europe, I've been to Iceland, I've been to New South America. And the one thing that's true is people are just people. There's good and bad in everyone. And people are really not, you know, sometimes I hear from um, Americans, oh, they hate Americans. The French hate Americans. Oh, I don't know if they like Americans. I always say that's so ridiculous. People, nobody is sitting in their country hating Americans. You know, they they interact with people one on one. If you're a good person, if you're a bad person, you'll get your good or bad response. Uh, just one final um, thing, perhaps, to talk about in relation to that, as we come to the end of this interview. One one of the problems I think is that people can behave if you if you look at um, young British tourists going to the Spanish party resorts they do behave very badly that that's very obvious they get drunk they dance on cars and so on um, and and sometimes the kinds of behavior with the particular groups of tourists from particular countries can create a, an image of that country which is entirely false Right. Um, but but he's nonetheless powerful because, you know, in a, in a way, many people will only meet American tourists in public spaces in London that they are sharing with American tourists. Right. And those American tourists and the way they behave will right. be, will then determine their their perception of the behaviour, won't it? I mean, that's <laughs> inevitable. And I, I think when we travel, we all need to remember that, that we are representing our country or our ethnicity or our gender or our culture, somebody else's place and the way we behave, we'll leave memories with that local population. Yeah, I, and I think, and I think, and I agree with you 100%. And I'll just give a little nugget on the other side. 
also re realize if you meet somebody offhandedly in Trafalgar Square that happens to be American acting crazy, just know that that's that person. That's not all Americans, <laughs> you know? So I, I, I think it's, it's a little bit on both sides. We need to like, we need to have act, act with respect when we come to another country, we experience another culture. And we also need to take a little bit of a breathe in and realize this one incident does not define a whole country, a whole continent of people. No, of course it doesn't. Uh, I absolutely accept that. But I must just finish because it was a joke, a half joke told to me by my parents that, of course, in the run up to D-Day, we have very large numbers of American servicemen stationed in the UK. And most of the English men, the British men of um, of that kind of age group were abroad fighting. Um, but it has left a memory in that, that age group, that population of American men being oversexed, overpaid and over here. And, well, and yeah. in a way that was a definition of the experience of the American servicemen during the Second World War. And that, that will die out with that generation as, as they die out. But it, obviously those kinds of very large movements of people do define people's yeah. understanding of, of another nation the same in vietnam with with american troops and so on. Absolutely. i don't think we can avoid that but i think through travel and tourism we can if we remember uh, to behave well we can do a lot to repair those images that we have of other countries yeah and i think travel and tourism has a, a great opportunity in particular now to like i said expand the stories you know include a local tour is get off of the resort you know yeah, um, we can have absolutely. tours make sure that you do you, you put the effort in to increase the diversity of the experience and the offerings that you're offering clients so that they can have a better experience i think for me personally i have a friend who's from china and that colors my my opinion of china right now china's yeah. getting a bad name but I have a friend named Ling who I am a friend, you know, she's, so China is not this far off distant place with strangers. My friend Ling lives in China, you know? And so I have a, I have a conversation with her about what is true and what's going on with real life. And then you realize that we're really just people. So I feel like if, if tour operators and travel professionals would ex expand the stories and encourage their clients to interact in local spaces, there'll be more understanding that Absolutely. people are Absolutely. Gay, thank you very much for your time. I've enjoyed that conversation. I'm sure lots of people will find it, some of it amusing, and I hope all of it enlightening. Thank you for your <laughs> I time. Do too.